So uh, I'm hoping the Reshikama will now switch him on. <laughs> and right. there. Hello, everybody. <laughs> She's like, welcome. Thank you very much uh, also for the nice uh, intro. So let me uh, project my slides, which we tested earlier. So normally, maybe you could confirm that you see all of that around me. I'm assuming so. Oh. Yeah, that's okay. Thanks. Great. Okay. So um, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, showing to you how uh, RumbleDB works, uh, how to use it with a, a smooth uh, intro. And uh, for this, I'm assuming first that you clicked on that button and uh, did the preparations. It's not really so much actually just about making sure you have Java and then downloading the uh, RumbleDB jar. But I, I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, put again the, uh, the, the links in a while. Um, I'll also monitor the chat, so I make sure I see that there's, uh, yeah, so I'll keep the chat open if, uh, if uh, people have questions, I'm seeing it, right? So I'll also monitor that. Um, so um, before I start, uh, what I like to say is that Rumble is a complete publicly released and documented system. You can find it uh, over there. It was actually the work of uh, many of my students. Uh, over uh, over the years. It's basically just a jar. There are several versions. There is one that works with Spark that is uh, tinier. There is a, a bigger one that we use today. Uh, there's also a way to install it in Homebrew, even though we've been trying for a while to get it registered, but uh, it's taking a bit of time. And uh, we also have a Docker uh, edition, right? So what is RumbleDB? It's an, an implementation of the JSONic language, which is a, a, a cousin of uh, X query. So it's 95% X query, uh, which maybe you can recognize here, the flower, beautiful flower expressions. It can run on uh, clusters of machines. So I'm speaking here potentially uh, hundreds or thousands of machines that execute all of this on uh, terabytes uh, or petabytes of data, right? That can be on HDFS, on S3, so you can store it at 10 of places, right? Also, uh, we tested it with Azure Blob Storage. Uh, we haven't tested yet with Google Cloud, but probably it, it will connect as well. It also works locally on your local file system. Uh, it works with, uh, it can read text, JSON, CSV, Avro, Parquet, Roots, that's for energy physics, uh, LibSVM and so on. So plenty of different formats uh, that uh, I will argue uh, uh, are actually just like JSON in terms of the, uh, the data modeling. So this is why it can read all of that. And uh, the vision, you might have heard of the term lake house, which was um, thrown a couple of uh, months back by uh, uh, Databricks. So we view JSONIC as the ideal lake house language for the whole pipeline from data cleaning, validation, all the way to machine learning and, uh, and uh, making predictions. But today, we are not going to be using clusters of machines. We are going to be using your own laptop. And I hope I will show you how, uh, how uh, how much performance you can actually squeeze out of your laptop uh, by spreading the computations on the course uh, as RumbleDB uh, will do. Uh, but you, uh, if you want later on to try it on a cluster, you will see it's not really very different. Actually, in just five minutes, you can click on a few buttons, set up a cluster, and get started reading data uh, stored on S3. Uh, there are several ways to interact. One of them is via Jupyter Notebooks. This is what we use actually for teaching in the lecture. So the students have Jupyter Notebooks with RumbleDB running as a server. It takes a bit more time to set up. So this is why we are not going to, do, to be doing that today. Today, we use the shell, which is much simpler to run. It's just a one-line comment uh, as specified in the uh, preparation uh, repository. Um, so just a few um, high-level words. What it is about is that Traditionally, as uh, seen in the 70s, data was flat and homogeneous, right? It's a relational database is well covered with SQL, but in the real life in the past few decades, we've started seeing uh, some deviations from that. So data sets that, get, especially those that get attributed over a very long time, do not actually fit in there. You can have extra value, missing values, invalid values, nested values that even break the first normal form. So it's nested and uh, heterogeneous, and in fact, when you're looking at that sort of data, you're no longer looking at tables. You're actually looking at collections of trees, JSON trees, XML trees. Uh, it's, uh, it's all the same idea. So the way that it can look like in that case, the format is called JSON lines that we are going to use today. Actually, our data sets will be JSON lines where you have one JSON object on every line without any new line within the object. And then you can have uh, billions of, uh, of these. But as you can see, it's not fully flat because there are a few, uh, uh, differences in the in the structure across the objects, and this is where the power of RumbleDB 
lies. So the data set that we will use today is uh, an example of data set that wouldn't technically fit in, uh, in, uh, uh, um, in relational tables. Uh, it's uh, from GitHub, the GitHub archive, uh, the full data sets. Um, um, actually, I think it's even bigger than that. This is one file that can have, uh, no, sorry, it's a full data set. I was just confused for a moment. 2.9 billion events, uh, 7.6 terabytes. And you can see there is nestedness in there. You have objects nested in arrays and so on. Um, and as you can see, even though each object in the data set, each one of the billions of objects has less than a hundred attributes, in total, there's more than a thousand attributes, which is already beyond what a relational database can handle. And the reason is that not all attributes are in every object. And in fact, you even have mismatching types on the same bats in the sense of X bar. Okay, but let's back now to the, get back to the tutorial. So I'm assuming you have Java installed uh, and that you have downloaded the, uh, the Rumble jar. You can quickly test whether Java is correctly installed by typing Java dash version in your command line and checking that uh, 11 uh, is coming out. Technically, it probably will work with eight as well if you have Java 8. 17, we haven't really tested. It might be that it's backwards compatible, uh, but normally Spark really documents it as Java 8 or 11. So this is why I'm focusing on 11 today. So I'm assuming that you have, uh, that you have uh, Java installed and that it works. And I'm also assuming that you created a directory somewhere uh, on your laptop uh here just for example slash temps uh, rum, slash rumble db tutorial and that you cc yourself to that directory and for simplicity we are putting every everything there right we will put the data we will put the rumble db jar we will put the queries everything in there you don't even have to worry about the path variable or anything because we're just using the standalone jar so this is why it's actually simple and you just need java uh, working properly okay <clears throat> So here, this is part of the preparations, but just to make sure that you went to that page with the Rumble DB releases, also linked from the homepage, that you downloaded this, uh, this jar right there. So the other ones, you see, they are smaller because they actually do not contain Spark. So they would run in uh, an environment where Spark is already installed. But the one we're using is this one, standalone, which you see uh, has in, inside everything that it needs. All right, so you just, I am assuming you downloaded it and put it in that, directory and that if you type this command java dash jar rumble db blah 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 blah, blah dot jar then you see that um so maybe i can uh, uh just quickly check that uh, everybody is with me there and that if you type this then you get something that more or less looks like the screen right there So maybe if you're on Zoom, you can uh, raise your hands when you're with me and uh, in the room. I, I wonderful. I see a raised hand here, uh, and uh, also in the conference room. Yes, you can virtually raise your hand as well by clicking. I think it's somewhere somewhere near here. Uh, there, there is a reaction button. Yeah, I see plenty of raised hands. Wonderful, wonderful. So. You are with me. Okay, so I have two more slides and then we'll uh, actually start uh, getting things done. So just to make sure that everybody is with me, this is, if you know XQuery, you'll be right at home. Uh, the data model behind the language uh, is made of atomic values, right? The same ones you have in XQuery, objects and arrays uh, that would be in XQuery. So in the, uh, uh, the XML based XQuery, so that's uh, elements, attributes and so on and so on. This actually also exists in XQuery uh, 3.1 as a uh, map uh, and, uh, and arrays uh, and uh, functions also are part of the XQuery language. We are not going to use them today, but these actually are beautiful for machine learning models uh, to store as functions. Okay, so this is the data model. These are the items uh, that you can have and everything is a sequence of items. So what's absolutely beautiful and the reason why it actually generalizes uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, beyond relational databases, and this is all from XQuery, is that the sequences of items can be uh, homogeneous, uh, right? You can have empty sequences, sequences of integers, of booleans, sequences of objects that look alike, but then you can also have 
start having heterogeneous sequences, right? So you see you have the whole spectrum of, um, of uh, uh, heterogeneity versus homogeneity here, right? So the, the closer you are here, the closer you are to relational databases, and the, the more you are there, the, the farther apart you are from uh, relational databases. Um, and so just so that you see, there is also a sweet spot in the middle that is uh, neither quite there nor quite there, which is uh, also known as data frames. Uh, there's a hype about pandas and so on, but basically the idea is that you can also nest data. So you can have, this is an example of schema where you have here an array of objects, right? And you can represent them in, the, in this way. So what I want to, to say with that slide is that this is really more than just JSON. And this is why uh, you can, of course, store that as JSON, but you have also binary formats. Uh, I will also show you how to uh, create them that are much faster than JSON, even though in spirit, they are exactly with the same data model, except that it's been validated. All right. Um, these are all the people that contributed to the engine uh, in the past few years. So now, if we want to use uh, the jar that we have just uh, downloaded, um, I'm looking for my mouse. Uh, we have three modes of running it. We have REPL, which is the shell mode that we will use today. Run, which is to run a specific query stored as a file. We also use it today. And serve, we won't use it today. That's for the HTTP server that you can run with uh, uh, notebooks, right? So now, if you could now run java-jar rumbledb blah, 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 REPL, uh, and that should open a shell for you with a few example queries and instructions. Uh, and uh, once you have opened the REPL, you can try as the first uh, uh, exercise to type some arithmetic expressions like addition, multiplication, and so on, and press enter twice uh, to, uh, to, uh, to check that it's working and that it's executing correctly. So you can use all of these, uh, you know, it's like X query. You have uh, uh, the, the operations, just D for division, uh, ID for integer division, and you can use parentheses. So this is more like a hello world. So now I'm going to wait until everybody is with me. I go to check for the raised hands. So again, to get there, you need to just do the same as earlier with java-jar, but you add REPL uh, on the right. That's basically the main difference, and then you can type. Don't worry. Yes, that's a good point. Do not worry about the warnings. This is actually coming from Spark, uh, and we cannot do anything about them, but these warnings are really just not, uh, not important. right? So uh, you don't need to worry too much about what he says about Hadoop or uh, some sort of uh, uh, deprecated APIs in Java. Yeah, it's outside of our control, but it still works normally. Okay, so who is with me also in the room? See a few raised hands. Wonderful. How does it look like in the in the uh, conference room, in the Alan Turing room? Uh, maybe one of the moderators. I think we're doing fine. Thank okay, you. that's good. So that's all good. So now you're all set up. So this is what it should look like, right? You can type something, you press twice enter, and then the result appears here, and you even have some timing information of how much time that it actually took. Something that I also want to tell you, uh, because uh, the first queries will be simple, but then in the interest of time, you know, we, we go uh, exercise by exercise. In case you are lost or you didn't have time to, uh, to type a query entirely, what I did is that in the same, a GitHub repository where you have this preparation button pointing to, I also stored all of the solution queries, one point JQ, two point JQ, and so on. So they are all stored in there. And what's nice is that since uh, uh, JSONIC is a cousin of XQuery, which is a W3C standard, it's uh, natively interacting with the web, which means that all you need to do is java-jar, rumble, blah, 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 run, and then the URI, yes, the URI on the web, of the uh, query. And if you try that, it's going to actually execute it. And of course, you can also download the query to see what's inside. But 
in spirit, that's exactly going to be the same thing that I show you on the slide. So this is in, in case that uh, you, you know you, 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 you want to just copy paste directly uh, or play around with the queries if you didn't have time at some point to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to type them by hand. All right, so you can, if you want, you can try that out with run instead of REPL followed by the URI of each. And then of course you can increment the, uh, the numbers right there. Okay, did anybody manage to execute it in that way? Yeah, all right, very good. So I will not repeat that, you know, it's for every query it's going to be the same and you have the number right here where, where I indicate what we are doing. Okay, so next let's proceed to, uh, to uh, another uh, task. We are going to open this JSON lines data set that is on the web, right? It's under this uh, URI right there. And what I would like you to do is to open that data set on the shell. So you should still be on the shell that you opened with REPL, so Java jar REPL. And now you should type a command that opens that data set and lists, lists the contents. And the hint for you is that there is a function JSON file that can be used to open these JSON lines uh, files in this format. So I will give you now again a bit of time. And another hint for you, the parameter of that uh, is a path, of course, but it's a URI and that URI doesn't need to be local to your file system. You can again use an HTTP URI. So you can directly put a URI like this as a parameter, as a string parameter, double quoted of JSON file. And it works also on HDFS, on Azure Blob Storage, on Amazon S3, it just directly reads from there. So now I'm waiting for you to raise your hand where, when you manage to uh, uh, open that data set on the shell. So to be clear, you don't even know, you don't even need to download it for now, right? You can directly read it from the, from the web using the HTTP. It's small enough uh, that, uh, that it should just work if you have a, a decent connection. Something else that I should say is that if you go to the preparation link that I shared, uh, that, that, that is the GitHub repository, at the top of the page this morning, I added a few links and this is in the list of the links. So if you don't want to type this by hand, you can just copy paste the link from the preparation page on top, right? You will find all of these links in there and uh, that will also accelerate uh, so that you don't need to type manually. Okay, is any, does anybody manage so far without me showing directly the solution? Yeah, somebody managed. Okay, so what does it look like? This is what it looks like. You just say JSON file parentheses, then you put as a string, double quoted string, this uh, HTTP URL, and uh, then you close the parentheses. Now, what did I do here? I put it on three lines, right? But this is just cosmetic. You can also have it on one line. It doesn't matter. It's exactly like xQuery, right? You, 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 the, 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 it's not new line sensitive in the expressions. So when you type this, you will notice that it's actually displaying a lot of JSON. So don't be scared. It's escaping, of course, the, uh, the, the, some things in the strings. Um, and it warns you, uh, but this is because this is big data, right? Uh, so there are so many items in the sequence. Actually, there are 36,000 items. Uh, in this uh, in this file, but in order to not explode your screen, uh, we cap it at 200 items. So only the first 200 are shown, but actually in the background, it has the potential to read all of them, right? And we'll see other ways than the screen to actually uh, store everything, right? But in the shell, it's quite convenient to, uh, to uh, list that, and you can even adapt. If you don't like 200, you can pick a different number. There are also command line parameters from, uh, for that. So who is with me and managed to do that? Wonderful, I saw a few raised hands. And again, you can also use this uh, 2.jq directly from the web as I showed you earlier. In fact, on the web, it's not stored that way. I think it's stored with a relative URI because if the query is on the web, then the relative URIs work uh, just fine. In the query, it will just look up the relative URI uh, where the data is relative to the query. All right, let's proceed then. Here's the, th the third assignment I want you to return the first object, just the first one in the previous data set. So not the entire data set. Uh, and uh, here's a hint, you can use this uh, square brackets notation that is a postfix predicate. 
and you can use that postfix predicate with a number that is the position in the sequence. So here it's a sequence of 36,000 plus objects. And if you put square brackets with a number inside, that's the position of the item to return, right? So you need to return just the first one. So on the left, you have the sequence. So that would be JSON file, right? On the left of, of the square brackets. And then inside you would put the position, which in that case would be the would be the first one. Then again, you can raise your hand when you are done so that I have a bit of feedback. Ah, I see raised hands. Okay, so when I see what I do for the next query is that as soon as I start seeing a few hands, I will show you the solution. You still have a chance to make it work. So this is what it looks like here. We just added this uh, square bracket one in there to just show the first object. So you can see it's much less verbose than the first query. This is actually very uh, useful when you explore. If you don't know the data set, you don't, you don't really know what it looks like. Then typically the first thing you do is you look at the first object and see uh, you know see what it looks like. And so in the in the next task we are trying to explore that data set and to try to uh, to to find out what it's made of. So this is one object right there uh, from this data set. As always, you can use the three dot jq from the web and then do Java jar rumble uh, run blah 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 three dot jq in order to run this. It's automatically going to resolve the data set UI relative to the query stored on the web. Okay, here's the next one. I would like to know in that data set what all the top level keys are. You know, these are all JSON objects, so they have keys. I would like to have all the top level keys you, uh, with duplicates eliminated in that previous data set. And I have a hint is that there is a function uh, of JSONE called keys that takes a sequence of items. You don't need to worry about prefixes because in RumbleDB, the, uh, all the standard built-in functions, they, they are uh, uh, automatically resolved when there are no prefixes. Right? Technically, it's the JSONIC namespace, so JN as dependence to FN in X query, but you don't need to prefix the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the functions here. Um, and so if you call keys on a sequence of items, uh, it's going to return all the unique top level keys of the objects. If there's a raise, if there's atomics, it just ignores them. It's only looking at the objects. But in our case, it's a sequence of objects, right? So try to call this function keys on this data set. We have a first hand raised, wonderful. And a second one and a third one, wonderful. So here it is. You know, it's actually simple. You still have this JSON file call with the data set right there, but now we nest it in this keys, uh, in this keys function call. And you see here, you have all of the keys. They are not so much, actually. There are just eight of them. There are the eight keys that are at the top level of our data set. Now, if you are a fan of the new features in XQuery 3.1, like these function calls with the uh, uh, equal greater than a row, uh, normally, it's, it's, it might also work. I think we implemented it probably in that release. So JSON file, blah, 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 with the row and then keys with no parameters, just object oriented like, that should also work if you prefer to work in that way. Okay, so this is for discovering the keys in the data set. Okay, now let's look at one of the keys. Let's call one of the, I'd look at one of the keys. The Where is it? Type this one here. You see there is a key called type. So let's try to look at the values associated with that top level key type. I want to see all of the values. Don't worry about duplicates. Everything that is associated with the top level key type, all the values. So a bit of a hint, object navigation uh, is done with the dot operator. This is just like in Python, in JavaScript, in Java. So this is in order to be appealing to uh, people who are used to these languages. So we use, we use the, uh, the dot uh, operator and you can use it after any uh, uh, sequence of, uh, of items and it also works I insist on sequences it's just like xpath right so just like the slash in xpath the dot works in the same way uh, in json right and as a side comment what it means is that dot is a special character so in, J in the json okay. syntax dot cannot be a part of the variable names uh, in the same way that it can be in xquery right that's the price to pay to, uh, to get the dots operator. 
Okay. Has anybody succeeded? Yes, I see a raised hand. Wonderful. Two raised hands. This is how it works. JSON five blah 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 dot type. So if you know XPath, that should actually be quite natural to you. And then you would see a sequence of strings because these are all strings in there that is printed. So again, you see there are so many, there's 36,000, there's one for each uh, input object. So this is why you only see the first 200. But again, you even have the explanation on how you can, if you want to experiment, if you change this parameter on the command line and you add a, a different integer than 200, then you can actually control uh, what you show here. All right. Uh, now, I would like the unique values. So if I'm looking at this, there's duplicates, right? Push events is appearing uh, several times. So what about the unique values associated with the top level key type? It's actually an X query function in that case. It's, so it's already existing in the standard. It's distinct values. Uh, in a nutshell, it takes a sequence of atomic values and eliminates the duplicates in there. All right, so try to list all the unique values associated with the top level key type. I'm assuming that for those of you familiar with XQuery or XPath, this should actually be a walk in the park, uh, these sort of things. Okay, so a few of you manage. So now I have here uh, the solution. This is distinct values called on JSON file, blah, 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 dot type. And now you, you see you have much less values in there. So here we have all the duplicates that have been eliminated. All right. Okay, let's move on then. We are making good progress. So now let's count the duplicate values, but now I want not type, but created that. So count the unique values associated with the top level key created that, right? So the first queries are simple and now we are just raising slowly the, uh, the, uh, the bar um, smoothly. So a hint is that there is a count function that's also a, an X query and X path function, right? Counts takes a sequence of items and returns its size. So the number of items in that sequence. So again, I'm counting the unique values, right? Not the, the total number, but the unique ones. Okay, Let's see if one of you is done. All right, several raised hands. So this here is the solution, count of distinct values of JSON blah, 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 created that. And of course here, if you are a fan of this uh, object oriented like notation for function calls, then this is typically where it can be useful, right? If you chain the function calls, you can also use the arrow uh, notations, right? But this is just the advanced uh, mode. And so normally, did you find the same number, 3597? And if I did my preparation well, that should that should be. I don't see any confirmation. I'm just assuming that this is the case. All right. Now I want to show you, and this is where we start scaling, not the count of duplicate values, not duplicate values, because this is a small count, but now the entire data set that is in this in this file. So the total number of items in the data set. Normally I don't need to give you any hint in there uh, because it's it's just done in the in the, in the same function. So how many items are there in the data set? That should be an easy one. Any raised hands? So you just need to remove things compared to the former query actually. Okay. So count works also on very large sequences, right? So it means that you just say count of JSON file and here you find 36,577. So here is the beauty of the language of functional language like XQuery and JSONIC, which in that respect have the same design. Um, the, the beauty of it is that it works on uh, two digit or five digit numbers, but it also works on higher numbers. So with RumbleDB, what we did is basically that we pushed the language to billions and billions and billions of items in the same single sequence of items. This is what we pushed. So let's try it and just download the bigger data sets then. So let's, go to this uh, 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 file right there. 
it's big, right? So I, I, I think you can try it to directly refer it as HTTP, but then you're going to trigger a download every time. So probably not a good idea. So what we're going to do instead you just, is just you just download it locally to the directory that you created right next to the to the jar. The URL to that data set is also in this preparation page, right? So if you use the preparation link, uh, the link should be there. And all you need to do is click on it, save as, and then store this file, git archive big dot json right so i'll give you a bit of time to download if you did things well it should be 500 uh, 500 uh, megabytes is it too much so i'm waiting until on zoom you raise your hands when you are done she's, with she's downloading not. yes uh -huh. i know the cwi has a very good uh, bandwidth but I'm yeah. so sure the Wi-Fi in this hall has a similar. Ah, OK, yeah. In the worst case, as a fallback solution, in order to, to continue, if you don't manage to download it, just download the original one, the one we've used before, right? So the git archive.json, you can download this one instead, and then you can continue to, continue to work with the smaller one. You, you will still be able to do the, uh, the assignments. But if you can and you, you manage to download the 500 megabyte one, then it's even better. But don't worry too much. Even if you don't manage, the, the smaller one will do just fine too. All right, I see a raised hand. Somebody who managed to download it. Okay, <coughs> more raised hands. Did anybody so far in the uh, Turing room manage to download it? Did it work for anybody who is physically in Amsterdam? Or is there at least a progress bar that? Uh... Yes, there's somebody who managed to. I see. Oh, wonderful, minutes. wonderful. So, normally it should work for a few, or for hopefully everybody. So I'm going to continue because there, the next slides are, are just uh, the, the natural continuation. So you you can still continue to download in the meantime. But basically now I'm asking you to count the total number of items in the downloaded data sets, the one you've just downloaded. Oh yes, with a phone that might be a bit more uh, a bit more challenging. Yeah, depends on your data plan. But as I said, you can just download the smaller one. Uh, that 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 will do just fine as well. So the hint here is that relative paths are resolved to the working directory, right? Uh, so if you, for, for the purpose of here, because we have the working directory, the query in there is in there as well. So you don't need the, the HTTP URI anymore. Now you can just refer it as a relative path uh, from your working directory. More precisely, it would be relative to the query file, just like you're used to over the web, right? So it's relative to the query file that the data set is resolved. 30 seconds for the smaller one, yeah. So I can imagine that uh, that uh, with this speed, it will probably take, it would take more time with the bigger one. All right. So the solution now is, as expected, counts of JSON file. What changed here is that now it's a local uh, it's a local uh, URI because this is right on your laptop. You're, we are no longer downloading it downloading it every time from HTTP. We are just reading it locally, uh, and normally you should get a count of two hundred and six. 9,078. So who is with me? Who managed to download this? Or to do it in local with the smaller versions, which is fine too. I see a few raised hands. Okay, let's continue then. Okay, now on this bigger data set, from now on, we work with the local data sets uh, that you downloaded. So whether the bigger one or the smaller one, I would like to list the events that have the type push events in that uh, larger data set. And so a hint, if you know XQuery and XPath, of course, it's going to be easy. But other than that, uh, for those who don't know, you can use that same syntax that we used with numbers. It also works with Booleans. So if you put here a Boolean predicate, uh, it's going to filter. It's just like select from where. It's the where close of SQL. Uh, comparison, as in XQuery, uses uh, EQ, NE, LEGE, LTGT. Uh, you can, of, of course, there's also the general comparison, but uh, you know, it's uh, uh, closer to, uh, to the, um, the design intent to use the value comparisons. Uh, and in JSONIC, 
Also something you need to know, the dot is used for object lookup because of the, the looking like JavaScript and Python for people used to JSON. Uh, it's dollar dollar. It's a, it's a special variable that is not dot but dollar dollar for the context item. So basically what you put in there is a predicate and the predicate is going to be evaluated for every one object in the input sequence every time dollar dollar is standing for the current object which is why it's called the context item. Okay, I think I saw several raised hands, right? Oh, they are around again. So let me, yes, exactly. So this is the solution. It's JSON file. Now we have the relative, uh, uh, the relative path here. Now you have the predicate dollar dollar dot type equals push events. So now uh, it's interesting to understand what's going on here. Because in a typical engine, you would stream through, right? You open the file and then you, the, the, the engine is going to go object by object and stream its way through the uh, through the uh, 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 objects that they are in the data set. In the case of RumbleDB, it's actually different because what it's going to do is going to actually partition the data set into several batches and it's going to spread it over your cores. So it means that all, each one of your CPU cores on your laptop is filtering a, a distinct subset of the data set. It's all going on in parallel, right? So this is what's happening. This is all delegated to Spark and pushed down to Spark. Count is the same. When we counted the uh, number of objects in the data set earlier, it was actually counting partitions in parallel distributed on computer cores and then adding the uh, numbers of each partition. So it's efficient. Now, of course, the benefit that you get on a single laptop might not be the same as in a cluster, right? In a cluster, the benefit will be enormous. On a laptop, you do get a benefit, but if you are bounded by the input output and, and the speed at which you read the data from the disk, then spreading on the core might not always help, right? If, if the bottleneck is reading from disk, uh, it, it doesn't always help, right? But nevertheless, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, 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 an efficient use of your, uh, of your core, uh, multiple core resources on your machine. All right. Now, the next assignment is how many of these events, how many of the objects have at least five commits. How do I know that? Well, there is uh, a, a path in each object that is the object dot payload dot commit, and this is an array, right? Every time it's an array of items. And in order to know that size of the array, you need to use the function size. So size of the object dot payload dot commit gives you the size of the array for the current event, right? And now you want to filter the events based on that. So you need to use a Boolean predicate with the square brackets that tests for the size that is at least five. And then you need to count the number of events, right? So this query is using several of the things that several of the features that we have seen until now. All right, I see a raised hand. All right. So I will continue, you know, in the interest of time and advance, you know that the solutions are on the internet too, right? So if you if you didn't manage to execute your own, you can still run the one that is on the internet. So now it's 11.jq that does the trick. And so it looks like this, you have JSON file of your, your data sets, then you have the Boolean predicate that tests whether the size of the current object dot payload dot commits, is it greater or equal uh, th than five? Right, and then you count the result of that. So it's really a Lego game, a Lego game that you assemble the pieces together. And normally you should get with the larger data set, the big one, uh, 5,643, all right? And again, if you did manage to execute that, you can directly run it with the command I showed you earlier, java jar run ta 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 11.jq and that will just work. But of course it's going to read it from the web instead with the small data set because the bigger one would take too much bandwidth, right? But normally I, I put online this solution file so that it just works. If you try run on the file, it should just work. Okay, now I'm asking you to return all of the emails used in all commits. So remember that the commits are within arrays in every event. So you have the events with arrays of multiple commits and in the commits, there are email addresses. And the email addresses are located at dot author dot email in the objects that are in the commits array, right? And the commits array, we saw earlier that they are at dot payload dot commits, right? So this is really a navigation thing. You need to go down 
And also what you should know is that you can unbox, like open an array and make a sequence of item out of it with an empty square bracket expression, right? So just an empty square bracket expression is, is going to open up the, uh, the commits and it's all going to be flattened if you use it on the entire sequence, all right? So try to return all emails used in all commits, right? So you probably are going to use JSON file, a JSON file, blah, 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 and then dot payload dot commits, and then you unbox, and then you continue with dot author dot emails because it's just like the slashes in XPath, right? Then you count, you can return them. I see a raised hand. Let me show you what it's going to look like. Another raised hand. So JSON file, blah, 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 dot payload dot commits. We unbox, so now we are exploding the, the, the commit objects to a single flat sequence. Then we continue to navigate dot author dot email. And this is going to be a very long list here on the entire data set. And all of that is actually spread over the cores of the machine. And then it reassembles everything uh, at the end, right? Okay. Now, how many emails were used in the very first commit of each event? For, for each event, for each object, so an object is called an event in that case, for each object in the data set, look, the look at the first commit and count how many emails were used. So for this, you need the syntax to, ac to access a position in an array, right? So the nth member of an array uh, you need a double square bracket. This is because it's not the same as extracting from a sequence. If it's a sequence that was the, sim the single square brackets that we saw earlier, but if you want to, to, to look up a position within an array, uh, then that's the double square brackets. And this also works on sequence of arrays. So if, if you have a sequence of arrays, it's going to take the nth member of each one of these arrays uh, in parallel. So you need to open, ah, I see somebody. So JSON file, right? So dot payload dot commits. And then you need to use that to access the first one. So double square bracket one, and then dot author dot email. So you see the solution right there, right? JSON file, blah, 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 dot payload dot commits. You pick every time the first one, then the author, then the email. Then we eliminate the duplicates to count the number of uh, distinct emails. And then we can even count. I think I didn't ask to oh, say yes, how many, so yes count of distinct value and so on, okay? And as always, so now the queries are getting a bit more complicated, but you can always use the 13 jq solution file if you want to execute it directly, okay? So I'm assuming everybody is with me. Let's continue. So now you know in xQuery, there's these flower expressions. So you can actually rewrite your query for convenience using a cascade of let clauses. Uh, which can be very convenient. So try to take this query right there and now rewrite it as let, 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 let return. So this is a hint of what it looks like if you are not familiar uh, with uh, XPath and XQuery. So let, let return and you can assign variables using dollars. The magic of RumbleDB is that RumbleDB is not afraid of variables that have billions of items. You can, you can have in a single dollar Y, it can be a sequence of billions of items. It will just work just like that. So there is no difference in the treatment of one item or a billion items and so on. Syntactically, it's just the same. It's a functional language. And all of the complexity of the large sequences is automatically taken care of in the background. All right, so you just need to, to separate the logic instead of having the, the chain of function calls, you start let JSON file, let, let, let blah, 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 dot actor, dot login, let equal distinct values, let's count and so on, right? Has anybody managed to rewrite this as a sequence of let's? I'm, I'm assuming it's the time to write down the things, right? So it's probably the typing with your fingers. I see one race hand, so I'm gonna show you now. This is what it looks like. It's a sequence of let's, okay, I overdid it. I know that I overdid it, but it's just to make my point, right? So I'm first storing the path in there, Right, then I'm accessing the events with JSON file. So notice that here it's a large sequence, it's 200,000 items in there. 
then let actors, blah, blah, it's still 200,000, then log in. I overdid it, I told you, right? So I separated it. Then you have the distinct logins with distinct values and then return counts, blah, blah, blah. And you should get exactly the same results as before. This is just a rewrite. It's very convenient actually. And I know the students, they love to do it that way. Uh, which is the reason why we made sure that it works with very large sequences, because this is a quite natural thing to do. In fact, when people use uh, Spark or even Pandas, uh, if, if they really want to use Python, people tend to do that. They, they tend to do a cascade of, uh, of assignments. So of course, it's not an assignment here. It's a binding because it's a functional language and so on. But the, the, the spirit is there, right? This is what people do naturally. OK, so that's a cascade of let clauses. Now, I would like you also to show that this is supported to add static types. So you, you need to add type declarations in there to make sure that the types are correct. And here's an example how you can add types. You just need to as object, as integer star, if you want multiple. So this is just one object. Here it's a sequence of an unspecified size of integers. And you just need to extend this by adding the types everywhere. Right, so I'm going to also show you quickly. So in the interest of time, I'm, you know, I'm advancing, but you can all, as I said, directly execute it with the solution query. So here I added, this is a string. Here it's a sequence of objects. You still have a sequence of objects. You have a sequence of strings. Then you have again a sequence of strings, and then you have the count as an integer. Here I overdid it again, and then you return that. And RumbleDB is checking that. It's all doing this in parallel. So the check for the sequence is again distributed on the course, right? That it checks that everything is an object. All right, I'm advancing. Now we use the let's, right? Let's use the for now. So for each event, I would like to return the ID of the event and the number of commits. And you need for that an object constructor. So it's going to be this structure here for $x in blah, 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 let's $y as integer, that's an example here, and then return, and here you return an object, and then you populate that object with what you want, right? So just give a name to the key right there, uh, and then you have the ID, the first value, and here a second key, and then you have the number of commits where you need to actually compute it. So you need $x in JSON file, blah, 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 to iterate on the events, and then return, and then an object constructor ID, and then uh, you know dollar events dot ID, and then uh, some other key, and then size of dollar events dot payloads dot commits. Right, that's basically how it's going to look like. Let me directly show to you what it looks like. So you see, I even added a let here with the number of COVID. So I iterate on the events, right? Four dollar events. It's all done in parallel. So the for loop is automatically distributed over your course. And then you compute the number of commits with that size function that I told you about. And then you return two things, the ID with the, uh, the, 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 the ID value here and number of commits, you can use spaces because they are squats. Uh, and then this variable you compute it right there. This is uh, actually a feature that we don't have in SQL, the ability to, to do these let's kind of things, but it's very handy, okay? So, I will continue in, in the, if that's okay with you, in the interest of time, uh, is it okay if I continue or do you prefer that I wait for you and do a bit less? Just let me know. What do you prefer? I continue. All right, so I will continue. Okay, so now uh, what do I do here? Yes, I added a little trick because it might be, you might notice that there is a null, uh, you might have nulls in there. So if you add here a test for the existence to the number of commits, if it exists, you return it, otherwise zero. So that's an example of nested if then else in there. All right, now I'm asking you to sort the uh, event IDs and types but ordered by the descending number of commits. And for this, you have the order by clause that allows you to, uh, to, uh, to do this sorting. The interesting thing here is that again, this order by is spread over your CPU cores of your machine, right? So it's all done naturally and, and uh, by Spark. So it all works in parallel. Here it's an example of integers. You need some order by based on size of dollar events dot payload dot commits. Let me show you. So for dollar event in JSON file, you compute the number of commits. It's the same left close as before. And you see now I have this order by 
and become its descending, return the projection of the events to just ID and type. So this project function is a shortcut that I don't have to write explicitly the object constructor, right? So I just project to just ID and type here. All right, so this is how I sort things. Okay. Now, something else that you can do if it's not just a projection is that you can merge objects. So an example of that is that if you return the events IDs and the types and the number of commits, and you sort by the descending number of commits, it's not just a projection because that number of commits is computed. It's not just a value that exists within the data set. So you need to, uh, to merge the projection on ID and types with the number of commits. And the syntax for this is this with the uh, additional vertical bar in the object constructor is going to squeeze that into a single object with two keys, right? So let me, since I have a few minutes left, I think it's interesting that now you just sit back and, and, and watch. So for events in JSON file, we compute the number of commits. I order by the number of commits and now I merge the projection to ID and type, right? And I merge it with commits, number of commits, right? And I suggest if you want that you just, just directly run the solution query uh, in there if you, if you uh, don't want to type that, all right? What else can we do? We can build histograms. We can build histograms using a uh, group by because we have this group by uh, uh, clause in there. It's also going to be spread all over your CPU cores, right? So if you want to return the histograms of the number of commits, you basically just need to use that let clause with the number of commits. Then you need to group by the number of commits. And then you can have each bucket of the histogram with your actual number of commits, the grouping key, and then the counts of the objects that have this number of commits. It's just a group by, right? So again, I'm directly going to show to you and you can execute it directly from the web with 19.jq. For dollar events in JSON file, blah, 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 group by the number of commits. And here you have this computation. It's a shortcut for the if then else that we saw earlier. So we group by the number of commits. I order because it's nicer if I have ordered my number of commits and I return every time the number of commits right there, zero, one, two, three, and so on. And I count uh, the uh, number of events in each one of the groups. So you see here, I had zero commits. There were 90K plus objects. Uh, with one, there was 92 and so on and so on, right? We decreases as the number of commits increases. Um, okay, now what if we want to store it as CSV? In fact, we can. And the trick to save it as CSV is to validate that output. For this, you need to define a user defined type I'm going to show you. So directly you can say declare type local type as, and here that's a, a schema, it's a JSON uh, language. You, so you have a field foo with uh, the, the a date value and then bar, which is an array of integers. And then you have the sequence of item that you can validate against the uh, type star. It's a bit of an extension of X query. And then you can directly validate that. It's going to be structured because that's a data frame and then you can store it optimally. So let me show you, you can again execute it directly as 20.jq. I have a type here where I have my commits that is short. So here is just to show off that XML schema, which are the types used here has a very wide choice of types. So we use a short for the number of commits and a long for the counts. And then I just have my previous query right there, the same query I had before, but I validate it against histogram star. And then it's the same output, right? But now it's been validated. We know that there's two columns, commits, which is a short, and counts, that is a long. And now comes the cool part. You can save it because it's valid as a CSV file. And in order to save it as a CSV file, you can use the command line. So you need to exit from the shell and you do Java jar, blah, 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 run the query. And then you just need to say output format CSV here and the number of output partition, just one. You want to compress it to one file because you know it's small. Uh, we add the headers in there, right? And we overwrite that just in case it already exists and you do it multiple times, then it will not complain that it already exists. And here, that's the path to which you want to output, right? So you can save it as a CSV file. Uh, you can use, by the way, here instead, the HTTP blah, 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 20.jq, right? So if you want, and then it will just download the query from the web. You don't even need to 
type it. And this is what you get. It actually writes a CSV file to the disk with this contents. It actually just took a screenshot if you try to open it. So on a Mac, it's ju just opened it in that way. And you see how now you can actually start working somewhere else with your data in order to uh, visualize it, right? So let me continue. So to, to show you the sort of things that you can do, you can also take the time to do it offline because you'll have the slides and so on. So I'm just, just now going to go over uh, what is remaining. I tried to make to bring it to the next level. This was just 200K, that's nothing. What about more data? These are the original addresses for every day there is a, a JSON file that is compressed. I actually downloaded just three days of that, three or four days that I downloaded to my laptop. So you can do it with a WGET uh, specifying for every hour you have a, a specific file. You don't need to do it now, but I did it and actually, uh, I was able to redo the histogram, but now I just say JSON file with a star here. I'm reading multiple files. It's all the files that I downloaded .json.gz. It also reads from compressed. That also works. Uh, you don't even need to worry about uncompressing. It's exactly the same query. I didn't change the query. I just put here a different path, which is the Joker path to all of the files that I downloaded. This is a lot, right? And now how many objects were there? You can actually uh, inline the query like this. And so what I did is that I did, okay, Java, run count of JSON file of everything I have. Here, I'm not doing it on the shell. I'm directly doing it on the command line with this. So how many did I have? Look at that, 18 million, 18 million objects. And it just ran on my laptop, just on my laptop. On a cluster, we went to billions, dozens of billions without any problem. Like just to show you the, uh, the power of that. There is a trick also that you can use while it's running. You can open your browser to localhost 4040 and you can see what's going on with Spark, right? So if at some point you want to have fun and look at uh, what's going on, that's also an interesting thing that you can do, right? Again, something you can do offline after this tutorial. If, if you don't like CSV, maybe you don't like CSV, right? Or you want something efficient. Well, there's a really nice format called Parquet. It's binary. It compresses everything. If you have valid JSON, then you can convert it to Parquet. Here's an example of data set you can play with later. It's a confusion data set uh, that you can validate. Let me directly show you. Uh, this is a schema you can create. Uh, the, the exclamation marks means required. And here it's string, 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 string. So this is all a data frame. Actually, it's called the data frame. So we validate that file that we open as JSON. We validate it against that schema. And after we have validated it against the schema, we save it as Parquet using this output format Parquet that I showed you earlier. And what's really nice is you see the difference. If you try to execute a query with JSON, here it took 25 seconds to execute on the original file, which is a lot of text, right? But if you compress it to Parquet by validating it and outputting it to Parquet here, if you read it again directly with Parquet file Parquet, it only takes 2.5 seconds. So you see, this is what I tell my students, start converting it to a binary, validate your data, put it as a binary format, and then exactly with the same language, with JSONIC, you can actually also manipulate Parquet. Uh, data. Another cool feature that you can experiment with is that you can store modules on the web natively, just like you do with XQuery. So if you have a module stored somewhere, there is one actually here that you can play with. You can use the function and directly use the, the code that is downloaded from the web. All right. So all of that, uh, the, the last task that I showed you, you can try it offline and see for yourself. Try to push it. I mean, let me know if you manage to do more than 18 million uh, with uh, with the downloads of the GitHub archive. If you do, I'm very interested. And for the courageous of you, you can also try to look at the documentation of RumbleDB and use Amazon EMR to create a cluster of machines. And then you just uh, try to do it with billions. This concludes my tutorial. I think it's exactly 10 uh, a.m. So I hope that's, uh, that's the, uh, that it's uh, on time. And uh, thank you very much for uh, following this and uh, you can experiment. It's online, it's free, it's open source. So you can play with it as much as you want. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gislain.
Are there any questions in the hall? Nobody, nobody. Yes, there is a question. Wait a minute. I need to throw you a mic. Oh, you're going to throw the mic? Yeah, that's another good question. Yeah. <laughs> Very much on. Who was it? Ginder. So, uh, when I'm in the REPL, how can I execute a query from a file? Oh, you cannot. It's either or. In REPL, you type it. If you want to execute from a file, you need to do it on the command line. You do Java jar, blah, 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 run, and then the URI of the file. Right. But it's a nice feature request. I mean, if, if you think it would make sense to also be able to have an instruction on the command line, we can definitely consider adding that. I have a question of my own. Uh, when I try to get results, I got all these square brackets telling me how long it took. Can I switch that on and off in uh, some? Yes, no, there, there is a way to configure the, uh, the outputs. Uh, we will probably add some more documentation on that. So this is all using the, uh, the, the, the log4j uh, facility. And so if you, if you configure the parameters of log4j, it's just about adding a config file uh, on some path, then you can deactivate all of that. Uh, I think we will consider putting some documentation on that uh, so that people don't need to look it up on the log4j website. Dan, are there any questions in the chat? Well, then I think uh, this concludes your uh, tutorial. Thank you very much, uh, Gislam. And uh, um, we'll be back in at 10.30. Maybe one last round of applause. Thank you very much.